Hello. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Pruitt. I'm president of Radical Exchange Foundation. I think Joe Goldie will be joining us momentarily. And uh, I'm joined by Alicia Holland. Uh, Alicia is an associate professor in the government department at Harvard University. She studies the comparative political economy of development with a focus on Latin America. Her first book, Forbearance as Redistribution, the Politics of Informal Welfare in Latin America, examines the politics of law enforcement against the poor. She's working on a new book on the institutional determinants and challenges of large scale, large scale infrastructure projects. And she has generously agreed to uh, talk to us today about, um, about the history of, of land value and different ways of, uh, of dealing with it. So thank you so much, uh, Alicia. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here today. So, um, so I wanted to start the conversation by um, talking a little bit about the genesis of my personal interest in, uh, in the question of land value. So the, uh, um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, during the uh, you know, formative uh, decades of, of my life, there were several you know, really big uh, boom and bust cycles. So there was the, uh, the late 90s dot-com boom um, uh, followed by a bust in the year 2000. Um, there was a, um, and then there, you know, this sort of the web 2.0 boom started to really take off around 2009, 2010. Um, and both of these, both of these events had a really, really powerful effect on the, uh, on the culture and the economy of the, of the Bay Area. Um, and one of the things that, um, that was most evident is that they sort of, uh, uh, in, in both cases, in different ways, they sort of ratcheted up inequality and in, in various ways sort of choked off and excluded some of the diverse culture that made the Bay, Bay Area such fertile uh, cultural ground to begin with. Um, and it, it became evident to me watching, watching these, um, these sort of macro economic cycles play out that the familiar uh, narratives about gentrification and so on weren't quite capturing the, uh, the full depth of, um, of what was going on. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd, I'd like to sort of start by posing the question to you. Um, you know, what, do you, what, is, uh, what is special about land? Uh, why do you think land is different from other kinds of things that we might uh, own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, so let me let me maybe start with the misconception about land because I think one thing is to say, well, land is is natural. It's a natural resource, and and that's one of its main defining features. But I think as your example of the Bay Area makes eminently clear, land is valuable because of the social context um, and the demand for, for land. Um, and so yes, it is a natural resource, but like any natural resource from diamonds to gold to oil, land is a product of our, so the society's demand for it. Um, and it's embedded in societies. But one thing is to say, well, there's a fixed quantity of land. You know, um, and I think this is one of the factors that, that makes it special um, is the sense that, you know, any given political unit has, hi Joe, you know, a finite quantity of land that's going to create pressures for its use and competition over its use. Um, the second defining feature of land, I, I think, is the fact that it's immobile. You know, we can't move particular geographic features. Um, and as a political scientist, we think that, you know, the fact that, that land is, is fixed in place or a piece of land is fixed also generates a really distinct politics. So landowners, as opposed to capital owners, are gonna have different ways of defending their interests. Because if I'm a capital owner, maybe I can pick up and move my factory a little bit more easily, but, if you know all of my wealth comes from the, the land itself, that's going to create you know a different 
a different politics because landowners aren't going to be able to just sort of pick up their their farm. Um, and so those are kind of two features that makes it makes land special. And then I think the third related feature is, is the fact that because there's a fixed quantity of land, we often think that it has social and collective value. Um, and so a lot of radical exchange thinks about the ideas of, of Henry George and, you know, that departs from a premise that we are all collective owners in a certain sense of, of the earth and the land. Um, and I work a lot in Latin America where, you know, many constitutions actually include the idea that there is, there is social value to land. Um, and as a society, we are all collective owners and therefore also guardians of the use of land. Um, and I think it is that sense that, you know, land is, is fixed and immobile and socially held that makes it special and makes the politics around its use pretty distinctive. Thanks. Joe, welcome. Uh, to introduce our second panelist, uh, Joe is a, uh, a scholar of the history of Britain and its empire who is especially involved in questions uh, of state expansion, the contestation of property under capitalism, and how state and property concepts are recorded in the landscape of the built environment. These themes informed her first book, Roads to Power, which very brilliantly, I might add, examines uh, Britain's interkingdom highway and its users from 1740 to 1848. Uh, so Joe, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, the question which with which we're sort of kicking off this conversation, um, I'd love to hear your take on it, is uh, what is special about land? What do you think makes land different from other kinds of things that, um, that one might own? It's, well, I think Alicia has given us a really beautiful introduction to the subject. It's um, as the, as the uh, people uh, as some of the interview subjects of a recent anthropological study said, land is not like a ma mat. It's not like a mat, mat. It's not something <laughs> that you roll up and take away with you. Land is there. And so it pa has permanency, it passes from generation to generation. There's only so much of it. It can't be replicated. You can't just make it more of it like you make more Teslas. Um, so it's, it's one of the domains like the planet as a whole, like our water and like our air, which was crucial to survival. Can you really have a homeless person? You can say, you know, I'm evicting you from this house that you've squatted in, or you can't sleep on this bench, you have to go someplace else, but a person can't get through the night without lying down somewhere. Yeah, they, everyone has to have a space somewhere. And so land issues also overlap with other issues of common holdings. And when I talk about a planet and I talk about there's only so much air and we have to protect it. There's only so much water, we have to protect it. Perhaps we wanna think about whether people have a, therefore a right to water or a right to land or a right to clean air. We're talking about collective ownership of a limited commodity. Uh, a, a limited natural resource, which can be defined in various ways as a commodity or as a piece of property. So, um, you know, Alicia did a beautiful job of, of referencing some of the main strands of thought uh, that folks at the Radical Exchange uh, Foundation are interested in about the limits of private proprietorship. So there's a kind of libertarianism in history, which is, uh, associated um, in the main with post-war the post-war United States, uh, which focuses on individual ownership and individual proprietorship as the epitome of a kind of economic system that makes capitalism work for everyone. But there's also a lot of evidence that that's, um, that, 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 that uh, there need to be certain limits on systems of individual proprietorship in order to protect common rights to land, water, and air. And certain kinds of commodities aren't appropriate to private ownership. Or the, the, so the, the really basic example that I've talked with Matt about elsewhere is uh, if you have a road, if you have a road, it could be a private piece of territory and then it's a toll road. And the problem with toll roads is that they limit access to the market of the poorest people in the community. And so you know, this, this is a drama that played out in the history of 
Western civilization about the, the time that Adam Smith was writing his Wealth of Nations. And Adam Smith weighs down heavily against toll roads and for using roads like commons, so that the poor man with his ass can get to the market. You have, you know, all you have is that is that donkey and that pair of shoes, you can get to the market and sell it. And that's part of what's supposed to make capitalism work. So I think part of what we may end up discussing is a provocative thesis, a thesis that in order to have functional capitalism that elevates economic and political participation in the way that we wanna see, we have to have capitalism with a commons, with common ownership of certain kinds. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the, um... Uh, the idea that you know, when when Adam Smith was originally talking about um, uh, free markets, he didn't uh, necessarily mean uh, freedom from uh, government intervention as much as he meant freedom from rent. Um, and I think a, a broad conception of this idea of rent is is really central to um, uh, to the uh, the sort of uh, more just economy that we'd like to see. And it's also important to efficiency. Um, so one, uh, you know, picking up off of this conversation about land, uh, I'd like to, you know, one thing that uh, um, kind of helped me uh, grok uh, this concept of land being a special kind of asset when I first started thinking about it was, uh, was it the shift from thinking about land as like pieces of dirt on the ground to thinking about space? Um, and I think that this is actually, this little shift uh, can be quite clarifying because when we think of, you know, when we picture land, we picture, a, you know, some grass or a, or, a, or a plot or something like that. But in a way, the, the common resource whose value we're really um, talking about here is uh, space or proximity to to other things, and I wonder if you if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, so, so I think that's re a really useful epistemological shift, Matt. Um, you know, in my early training, I wasn't in a history department. I was in an architecture department where it is interfacing with people from urban planning. And one of the things that we talked about all the time was the legacy of red redlining for the perpetuation of racism in the American city. So redlining, as you'll recall, was that period um, when uh, federally backed mortgages were, in were introduced, but were inaccessible to a large number of members of the community, especially if you were a minority or you lived in a minority area, you could not get the backing of the federal government. So what that meant was uh, it created this world of urban cities that we're familiar with in which there are white suburbs with good schools and lots of people who own their own home. And then there are African-American neighborhoods now, you know, certain there are African American neighborhoods that don't have good transportation, that don't have access to the best of school facilities, um, and that often have are then compounded with other kinds of economic difficulties. So there's a kind of naive, we could do a like, naive, how does the media think about this? And the media thinks about it like, well, those people must not work very hard. But historians of urban space have been looking at this for a long time and they've said, what do you mean they didn't work very hard? They had to take three buses to get to work. And why couldn't they have access to the buses? Was it because they weren't working hard enough to own their own home? No, because there were maps that told the banks not to make loans to those kinds of people. So ideas about racism were structured into the documents that literally enrich one neighborhood at the expense of another. They literally keep a certain set of people out from participating in the market. So you're yeah. not talking about free market dynamics and you're definitely not talking about an index of hard work or labor. You're talking about space, the spaces of the city, the neighborhoods, who has access to the resources and space, the transit, the, pu the public schools, the housing, and all of the goods that are bundled with that, including the mortgage, the right to the mortgage, the federal backing for the mortgage, and the, you know, the social networks that give you access, access to funds when you need them. Right. I think that's a, that's, a great, um, that's a great example that really vividly illustrates that the value um, in land that we're talking about isn't, doesn't necessarily link to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the characteristics of the actual 
earth, but it's 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 connected to location. It's about what uh, what the space is close to, how it's positioned relative to other parts of the you know social network that that people depend upon for their for their livelihood and and to participate in 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 their communities, right? I just add on one thing because although I like space, the thing that land does convey is a certain territoriality. Hmm. And one complication is once you start thinking about how governments actually regulate land and how the law shapes land use, space can be misleading because in a lot of property law systems, there are very different use laws when you talk about the, the, the land as a plot of dirt versus the subsoil and what's contained below that land. And then also the air rights and what you're allowed to do in terms of you know, density and, and building up. And so sometimes space to me has a vertical dimension that often has quite different um, political and regulatory frameworks than when you think about the, the physical use of a piece of land and these dimensions of proximity that we're talking about. But the... Uh... Um, that that makes sense, but don't you think that the you know the value, you, you know I, I don't know. To me, it's clear it's it's clarifying to think about um, you know the, the the reason why a certain uh, chunk of Manhattan is valuable. It doesn't really have anything. It, it's not that there's something special about the land. It's 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 where the land is, right? Um, I don't know. That's anyway. That's just the the little insight that that was helpful yeah, for me. I Maybe mean, somebody. I think it's location, 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 yeah. then you're a real estate agent, but it's also the way the state shapes what you can do with the land. So can right. you mine the gold below your main land? Can you build a 15 story building or a five story building? Or can you not build at all on a piece of land? And so yeah. I think we also have to think about those dimensions. And, and sometimes I think space starts to convey more than the, the physical plot itself. Gotcha. Um, so I, and I think that uh, it's useful to go back into history a little bit to understand the, the very long uh, genealogy of these, these conversations. Um, and uh, I think a good place to start might be with the uh, Enclosure Act. Um, I wonder if, uh, Joe, could you say a little bit about, um, about what that is and uh, how it connects to the more modern conversations about land? Yeah, yeah, I will talk about enclosure. Let me just pick up what Alicia was saying about land, though, and say that, you yeah. know, Alicia is right to signal that when we talk about land, we talk about a, a stack of so many meanings, you know, even more bu thickly bundled than the concept of property ownership. Um, so, so for many his, for many people thinking about the cultural imagination of land, what immediately pops into their head is nationalist movements, like, Germany for Germans. Let's exile all of the Jews. Let's exile all of the Poles. Let's make this a nationalist space. So that's that's a kind of nationalism wrapped around a concept of land, a concept of identity linked to the territory, uh, which is was typical of worldwide forms of nationalism from about 19, 1870 to 1940. And some people see that kind of territorial nationalism re-emerging right now in the kind of a current political climate in which ethnic identity and land are often linked. But there's also, you know, there are also other political meetings that go with land. So there are, you know, other, other movements that we'll probably talk about in a second, um, which have imagined land as this common territory, as what unites us in a nation is the access to land and the promise that this land is going to be managed well going to be managed well and we're going to fight out what that meaning of well looks like. So that might mean that we have public parks in our cities and it might mean that middle class people can afford their own house. Uh, it might mean that rent is controlled. It might mean that we have national parks or it might mean that the national parks are instituted in such a way that we evict uh, indigenous people from within their borders. So when we talk about land we're talking about a memory of a lot of political conversations stacked over time in which people have fought out. If we have a political boundary around this land, what are we gonna do with it? Who belongs here? Who doesn't? What are the highest and best public uses? So we come into the middle of a big long conversation, which is one of the reasons why I'm so glad that I've been invited 
as a historian. So <laughs> you, it has been. It was written that the uh, that the 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 original sin of history was the enclosure of the European peasant commons under the Enclosure Acts of Great Britain and similar legislation around Europe. So the Enclosure Acts uh, are were a a very long term process from the late Middle Ages all the way through the 19th century, which had to do with taking systems of land ownership that had been set up in the Middle Ages uh, that allowed um, Matt to have his cow and Alicia to have her cow and Joe to have her cow uh, on the park down the street. And the Enclosure Acts um, allowed, I'm going to pretend that I'm the Baron here, they allowed Baron Joe to kick all of your other cows off and uh, turn the park down the street into my private domain, commit the right to exclude, to exclude everybody else from property. So these enclosure acts were historically extremely important because they led to the consolidation of large, uh, large masses of capital, which made possible the period of investment associated with overseas colonization and the industrial revolution. I mean, it, it really enabled uh, the enclosure of these commons enabled the rise of an aristocracy that had capital from sheep farming of these hills where, where far, formerly there were lots of peasants farming to so these sheep farms where all of the sheep are owned by one baron who gets rich uh, and those sheep farms allow other forms of investment and other forms of financial innovation but at the cost to the livelihoods and well-being of those former communities and village villages which were um, relative uh, which were, were which had a relatively sustainable and relatively stable existence in an agrarian society. And because of enclosure, uh, those former peasants move in great numbers to the cities of Europe in the 18th and 19th century. So they partake in the process of urbanization and they're looking for jobs and they really have nowhere to go back to because you know the, the cow has been sold. And the family farm is now part of the sheep baron's farm. So where will I go? So there are smaller episodes of this and huge episodes like of this, this kind of enclosure, the most notable of which in Europe is probably the Highland clearances at the end of the 18th century, mass evictions followed by burning down of peasant huts across Scotland as the crofters who thought they had a traditional right to land were told, no, we, we've We've updated the contracts to modern individual proprietorship. And now all of your land belongs to the Baron and, and you need to go someplace else. And this is one of the features that prompts the mass wave of Scottish immigration to Canada and North America at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, the Highland clearances. So enclosure is a troubled topic. It's big news in the history of finance. It's big news in the history of investment, but it's also one of the features that immiserated millions of people over the long term in uh, European societies. Uh, and it's the memory of enclosure that prompts a debate beginning, in the eight, beginning as early as the 17th century, continuing in the 18th and 19th century, a debate about what a good economy looks like, what good land laws look like. And at the beginning of this period, the dissent, the dissent is inarticulate. It's written in the form of peasant petitions that are sent to the king and then discarded or laughed at. And by the 19th century, the critique of enclosure is fairly articulate. It's being written down by people like Karl Marx. Um, it's being worked out by political economists like David Ricardo and J.S. Mill. Uh, we have so we have a really rich set of intellectuals who are thinking about enclosure and its consequences and starting to ask questions about alternative ways to hold land in common. It would be more enriching and creating of opportunity for all. And I, I think that's a very that's a very important moment for people at the Rad Radical Exchange Foundation because uh, if you're trying to understand moments in economic history where people have looked at the hard tax of how we think things should be owned and bundled and regulated. That moment of thinking about land law, land law seems so obvious, seems like it's 
It's ingrained in Blackstone's law. It seems like it's part of modern England. It's what gave us this investor class. How could you question land law? And yet, at this important moment in the middle of the 19th century, everybody who's anyone in economics says, I think there's something wrong with land law. And that is productive of a series of conversations that I think we'll be looking into today because many of those conversations start to orbit around how land taxation should work so that more of the land can be owned by more people and land can serve more public purposes. It strikes, one thing about it is it strikes me as the exact opposite narrative to the idea of the tragedy of the commons, right? It's, it's true. It's true. So that the, the fantasy of the tragedy of the commons is that you can't have a common system because if you put, if you put one, if we have own the park down the street as a commons, Matt puts his cow on it, Alicia puts her cow on it, Joe puts her cow on it, soon the cows eat everything in sight. And it's just a piece of mud and it's of no good to everyone. It's much better if it's Joe's piece of property. So, so it's important to remember that the, the, the account of the tragedy of the commons is not actually a description of what happened in 17th century England in the late middle ages, anywhere in Europe. It's a description that's come up, up with by an ecologist in the 1960s who is modeling planetary degradation. How is it that a capitalist world in which everybody is using the land and the air and the water and polluting without regulation becomes a tragedy for everyone involved? Yeah, it's it's just it's a really interesting uh, 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 counterpoint, right? Um, so um, from here, I mean, I, I don't know if it if if it, we could go to the some of the nineteenth century movements that were a uh, a response to this, um, uh, you know, where we start to see a little bit more of a uh, a politics of participation. Uh, but I'm, I'm also curious if, uh, you know, Alicia, if you'd like to add anything to this uh, uh, about the, the commons. Well, I would just say that this narrative that private property rights are at the heart of the industrial revolution and capitalist development, I mean, it continues to be so strong globally and it it, it refracts to other regions of the world. So, I mean, this takes off in Latin America as well. And I would say much of the developing world and discussions about property titling, where the sense is the historic problem of many developing countries is first of all, there's, there's still communal and traditional property rights, um, which, you know, slightly different than the, the cow pastures that, that Joe paints for us, but, but similar ideas of, you know, community holdings that are governed through traditional mechanisms that, that are at the heart of the inefficiency of developing countries' economies. And then also there's a lot of informal and poorly defined property. So it's not clear who has legal title over certain land. And, and the Peruvian economist, Hernando de Soto, really brings back many of these tropes from the enclosure movement to say, if we just assign property titles, then suddenly it's gonna unleash this process of capitalist development that's gonna make you know, economies much more efficient. And, and I think it is it is premised on a pretty poor reading of history. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think replicates many of the same, the same flaws and inequalities that you see playing out in, in England as well. So, so this is just to say there, there are global repercussions of the way that history gets read in, in much of the developing world as well. Oh, Alicia, I think that's that's really beautifully fr framed. You know, the Desoto has Desoto has a lot of interesting theories about that go back to Coase about the importance of describing property rights and the the worth that a cadaster could have. And those are themes that also resonate with people in the Radical Exchange Foundation about the importance of documentation, uh, do visible documentation in a public place where everybody has access to it. But uh, there, there's also a sense in which you, you know, you read De Soto and you think, you don't really, you, you don't really, under, you're not really nodding at the history of empire, the history of eviction and displacement. And those are big words for us when we think about the history of land, eviction and displacement, mass evictions like the Highland clearances 
uh, but also like all of those episodes of Enclosure of Northern Europe and all of the episodes of the massacres of indigenous people in the America, in North America uh, and the displacement uh, and voiding of pro systems of property rights of colonized per persons across Latin America and most of Asia under European colonization. Uh, we're talking about a historical world in which people's property rights, collective or otherwise, were not recognized by Europeans under, uh, sometimes under a, a lie that a more efficient system of individual proprietorship was, would thereby make the system more efficient. And in reckoning with uh, those losses, the alienation of property by alien African-Americans, indigenous people, native colonized subjects around the world. Um, in reckoning with that, uh, in the last generation, a number of scholars of political economy have started to ask questions about the forms of, the forms of civil society that can atone for uh, those displacements. And so that atonement uh, falls under the, under the rubric of land redistribution. And it's a subject that we may find ourselves face to face with at some point in this conversation. So I think I think there's a, there are some really interesting comparisons to draw between uh, enclosure enclosure movement and the what happened in in Latin America um, in connection with De Soto's ideas. So Alicia, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, what uh, what De Soto's ideas were and how it played out. Sure. So Hernando de Soto is a Peruvian economist who writes two really important books. The first one, The Other Path in the sort of mid 1980s um, and then The Mystery of Capital. And The Other Path very much is a response to what's happening within Peru where a Marxist guerrilla group, Sendero Luminoso or The Lighted Path loosely in, in English is really pushing for land redistribution um, and greater equity in the distribution of property and an entirely different governance system. You know, it's Maoist inspired. Um, and so the other path is really, is a counter to that. Um, and De Soto's argument really is, is saying from a very neoliberal perspective that to get development, to get greater equity, all that really needs to happen is the government needs to, um, provide titles um, and legal documents over the assets that um, many Peruvians already own. So, um, you know, many, much, much of Peruvian, many Peruvian cities are settled through these processes of squatting on the outskirts. So you have many people who, who are living and have built houses on the edges of cities, but don't actually have any formal legal documentation. And then you also have many people working in the informal economy. So owning businesses or working as street vendors who don't have a sort of business license. And to DeZoto, this really creates two flaws. The first is that um, there's insecurity in property ownership in his perspective. And so people aren't investing as much as they might if they knew that you know, if legally challenged, they would be the owners of, of that asset. And then second, it also sort of gums up the system. So it's harder to actually use assets as collateral. So you can't you know, mortgage your house to go and start a business. Um, and you also can't transfer the assets to somebody who might value them more highly because there, there are no legal documents to make those transactions. Um, now, since he's written, there have been a host of critiques about whether the, these mechanisms actually make sense. So for example, is it you can't get credit through, or if you have a formal property title, credit markets certainly open up, or is it that you actually in informal markets don't have a system to transfer property. So one can question empirically the soundness of that argument. Um, and I think there have been, since DeSoto, the World Bank has invested really heavily in property titling initiatives. Um, and, you know, they've had some effects, but I think, you know, um, they've, they've been also heavily critiqued for not sort of being the, the panacea to development that, that you know, DeSoto hoped. And I think part of that comes from the fact that DeSoto was unwilling to acknowledge the inequalities in property ownership and the sort of 
economic necessities that drove people to occupy property informally or to work informally. Um, so for many people, squatting is, is, was the way to get housing and it reflected the fact that people were landless and they needed somewhere to live in cities. It wasn't about the number of bureaucratic steps that it was gonna take to get a formal legal document over their property. Um, I think also there's, you know, going back to some of Joe's points about, you know, how the process of identification, that there's also a real question of how valuable these documents ultimately are to people. Um, so there are many property titling initiatives that then end and people, you know, not updating their documents and ending in the same sort of legal ambiguity. Um, and I think that, you know, one criticism is that DeSoto didn't acknowledge how functional many other forms of identification were and that people knew who owned what, what the boundaries were and communities were defending the sort of property lines and that actually created a, a fair amount of fluidity and transactions within what to DeSoto seemed like these sort of lawless and you know impossible to, to, to function markets. Um, so there's some of the debates that come out of this big push to provide property titles as a way to unleash development. Um, but I would say, you know, in my own work, one of the main critiques I make is like, this, this just doesn't think enough about the underlying inequalities in, in access to land that really drive many of the the quote problems that DeSoto finds, which is, you know, people occupying the outskirts of cities or, or working in jobs that are starting businesses without, without licenses. So a little bit of more context on that, that world of Peru in which, uh, in which DeSoto was writing. Uh, another book, another book before DeSoto, a great consequence for these debates was Hugo Blanco's uh, Tierra o Muerte, Land or Death, published in 1967, uh, which was a call, a call to a decolonized Peru to, to rise up and to ask questions about race and land ownership and the legacy of colonialism. But it's important to, to remember that as recently as the 1950s, 1960s, um, most, many nations across Latin America and across Africa and Asia had land ownership patterns which were left over by seizures by colonizing European powers. So the hacienda system, a, a hacienda is a ranch. Uh, hacienda systems um, typically reflect land grants made by the Spanish crown to the military men who helped to subdue a district across Latin America. In India, it's a slightly different system, but it's a, there's a lot of land seizure where local indigenous property rights or Mughal property rights were nullified by the colonizer um, who, who instead created centralized land holding under a few private uh, leaders. So land or death is a kind of eruption of protest against this system of monopolization of land by the few, which was written by Hugo Blanco, a Marxist organizer while he was in prison. And he's writing to Peru's uh, in indigenous people who have lost their land and their contracts have been voided again and again. And he's saying, it's time, it's time that we took this nation into our own hands, our own imaginary. Let's go out into the streets. First, let's occupy the streets. Let's let them see how many we are. And so they go out into the streets in these huge processions. And then they start moving from the streets back onto the farms. And uh, Hugo Blanco is one of the organizers, but then there is a lot of spontaneous, what they call land invasions. And in a land invasion, the peasants go onto the fields that they think that they, that they're, that were far, farmed by their forefathers. So they go there and they squat, events of squatting. They're a non-violent form of protest of an economic order that is characterized by uh, violence and oppression. So in order to reverse these colonial seizures, 
the peasants and indigenous people are just claiming the land and refusing to move. So the land invasions that happen across Peru and across much of Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s are blessed by various left-wing political movements. You know, part of the work of De Soto is after, after uh, several decades of land invasions and land redistributions to ask for documentation, ask for documentation. But I think one of the curious things about DeSoto is how DeSoto was received in North America as a kind of credo that therefore, if you have land title, if you simply hand out land title and turn every peasant into a peasant proprietor, then you'll, you'll solve all of the other problems magically. Those people will have access to credit, banking will abound, you'll have micro loans, capital will flow, there will be widespread innovation and political participation, and you won't have any of the political conflicts that characterize the 1960s and 1970s. Well, this is a species of fantastic thinking, right? Because it's you know, essentially the people who were selling De Soto in that tone are trying to, are asking us to forget about the whole history of colonial, colonialism and post-colonial conflict in which entire ethnic groups have been denied the right to own land and started to protest that and to say, we can't imagine an economy or a political system where you don't do something about the fact that the land was stolen from our ancestors. So that's, that's uh, one of the issues at the base of this. Yeah. So I'm, I'm tempted to reach for a big historical comparison and then I'd love to hear you both sort of tear it apart. So it, uh, it, it seems to me that there's, a, there's really a parallel between um, what happened in the Enclosure Acts and what, uh, what De Soto was getting at. Uh, in, in the Enclosure Acts, what happened was a sort of an, an, an informal uh, system of access was, uh, was, was, formal, was you know, transformed into formal land titles in the favor of the rich, right? And in what, what De Soto was getting at was uh, transforming a sort of informal access system to formal land titles for the poor. So if you just looked at the uh, Enclosure Act, you might think, well, the problem with the Enclosure Act was that they gave everything to the barons. Um, and if we had just done the same thing in favor of the poor, you know, then it would have been great. That seems to be the logic behind De Soto. But, you know, what the, what the experience seems to show us is that, is that Perhaps they both made the same mistake in a way. Perhaps the mistake was moving from more open textured kind of, of rights, you know, things that resemble uh, squatting and, and you know, more, more uh, traditionally negotiated modes of, of use and access, um, and, you know, moving towards a, uh, a rigid uh, formalized system, right? In, in, in both cases, it's, it's that, that move towards formality that created, uh, you know, that, that, that backfired. Is that, so where, where am I wrong here? You wanna start, Joe, or do you want me to? Please. So in some ways, I think that, um, I wouldn't go so far to think of the move to, toward formality as always the original sin. I, I mean, I think my critique of DeSoto is more, it doesn't recognize the underlying social challenges and the demand for land where we started this conversation. Mm -hmm. So just to connect, you know, Joe's wonderful history of dispossession and the claim to land. So that is part of the story. But the other part of the story is also, like in England, urbanization and the draw to the city and the draw to proximity and people who are claiming a right to the city and a right to be part of the economy, but who don't have the means to pay for the land and pay the rents to be part of the city. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in some ways, one part that happens with property titling is, is recognizing, you know, um, or, or trying to formalize communal property rights and the sort of loss that comes with that. And, and there are inequities that come with that as well. But another part 
really has to do with the kind of um, the, the structural <laughs> challenges of who gets access to land and who gets access to housing in a capitalist economy. Um, and what you see actually happen in Peru and in much of the developing world is the problem is basically politicians give out property rights and one generation of people who have claimed land and claimed property around the city benefit. And then a new generation of people who need land and need housing come to the city and say, hey, we're here too. We, we also need land, we also need property. And so it continues to reproduce the cycle where the way to access housing and the way to access land becomes invading it, building on it, and then asking the government to, to recognize what has already been done. Mm -hmm. And now that actually, in some ways, and what I argue is that is a way of sort of equalizing access to land, but it also brings a host of other problems. And when you think of sort of the challenges for urban planning, the challenges to really access the full amenities of the city, obviously sort of having people build their own houses and then gradually improve them that often precludes them from many other um, forms of urban amenities and housing. Um, so I guess to me, I'm a little bit more reluctant to say that the actual, you know, act of, of enclosure or the act of formalizing rights is, is what makes the system fall apart. It's, it's the fact that you are providing those rights and assuming a system of private property is premised on some degree of equality that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so without addressing those inequalities in some way, any system of kind of pro private property provision is itself going to be unequal. Um, and so I think it's there in which I think collective ownership um, and private ownership only work <laughs> if they are thinking more fundamentally about, about creating conditions of equality yeah. and repressing past wrongs as well. But I mean, maybe it's better to say not the formalization of rights, but the sort of the, the structuring of rights is, the, is what I'm sort of getting at, the inflexibility of the rights themselves. I mean, you know, what do you think about the, you know, efforts to sort of um, uh, define more flexible, more open textured sorts of, of property claims? You know, so I mean, there, I think one way of looking at this is saying that you know, on the one hand, we've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, rigid property rights. And then on the other hand, we've got informal mechanisms of sort of political pressure that, that uh, eventually uh, result in modifications to those, to those rights. But there's, an, you know, I think there's a temptation for, you know, frankly, for me and for, for many others to, uh, to try to foresee that in advance, to try to say, why don't we come up with ways of defining property that um, uh, that are going to be able to accommodate this in inevitable inadequacy of the way that we define it. Um, you know whether that, and I think that can take many forms, right? It can take it can take the form of of ideas like the uh, you know self-assessed taxation in the book Radical Markets, but it can also take the form of things like rent control or things like um, uh, 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 land taxation, you know, in the Henry George sense. Um, uh, so, yeah, does that is what do you think of that? So, I, I wanted to back up for a second, Matt, sure. and just to put in an introduction about formalization. So, yeah. De Soto isn't the first, De Soto and enclosure aren't the only moments in time when people have tried to formalize our knowledge of what land is, who owns it, who's where. There, there are two episodes where uh, the history of ownership and the history of formalizing property description are linked to each other. But there's also the entire history of the cadaster. So a cadaster is a map of who owns which piece of land. And uh, for, uh, so I was telling the story of Hugo Blanco and you know, essentially post-war, post-colonial land redistribution projects. Many, many nations, both communist and socialist, uh, 
and even capitalist, practiced some form of redistribution in the decades following the Second World War. Most of them, out of some historical sense of trying to atone for the exclusion of ethnic minorities from the economy. And what most of them had as a tool for formalizing those new property relationships, the new form of just property relationships was a cadaster. So a cadaster is a survey. Cadasters cost money, so they're hard to create, but a cadaster is ideally a survey that says, I, I know I can plan out where all of the new plants of property should be. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give Alicia the stony piece of ground just because she's Alicia and I like Matt. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, give Alicia more ground because hers is stony. I'm gonna give Matt less ground because his is fertile and it's in a river basin. And I've surveyed it out and now I have a record. And I all, can also see because of that, but both of you owe me taxes. And we can invest those taxes in things that are gonna bring more opportunity to you because you're new landowners. You know, the land was taken from your ancestors. You need a startup grant. So we're gonna start a cooperative. We're gonna start extension classes. We're gonna teach you about agriculture. We're gonna teach you about manufacturing buckets and whatever else is needed for this brave new nation in which you all have pieces of property. So I think of those kinds of formalization. Formalization is not the enemy. Drawing a map is not the enemy. Knowledge of the territory and what different farmers might require is not the enemy. What's historically caused problems both in the period of enclosure in early modern Europe and in the period of uh, you know, the extension, what's known as the extension of the American frontier and in the period more recently of the, new, of the recent decades in Latin America that some have called the new enclosures or the period of land grab. Part of what, what's at stake there is is a structuring of a sector of the economy around an intuition. And that intuition is that the landlord is the sole source of value and only certain people can be landlords. Sometimes those laws have been formalized in ways that exclude people by ethnicity. So for example, in Ireland, Catholic, Roman Catholics were forbidden from inheriting property in, uh, in the New England colonies, only white, white people could own property. Uh, native subjects, um, indigenous people and African-Americans were redlined as we've seen. So they were forbidden from benefiting from the mechanisms of cheap land ownership in American cities in the post-war world. We, we aren't out of that. We're still living with the legacy of those exclusions from property. Uh, and in the land grab, um, in the land grabs of the last, the last 10 years, for example, what you're looking at is less an ideology, I think, maybe Alicia can correct me, less, an, less a problem of an ideology that says only white people should own Africa, or only white people should own, only North American banks should own property in Latin America, than a compounded series of privileged institutions from the World Bank on down which have tipped the scales towards typically white moneyed elites in North America, towards all a very, very small slice of people. And we can think about how cadastres and other forms of, of and land titling and other formal mechanisms could be used to decentralize the monopolization of land because we think that you know, land is a commodity which should be measured, which, which uh, presupposes any individual effort at economic innovation or self-improvement or political participation. I can't have political participation. I can't, I'm not gonna invent the next widget if I'm a homeless person who's just gotten displaced from my squad under the bridge. We can think about ways to more widely ensure rights of inhabitation, rights of occupation, rights to land and water. And we probably should, because the evidence is that that land monopolization, those land grabs, has been tilting land ownership into the hands of a smaller and smaller elite in recent years. Let me try to link those thoughts a little bit, because I think, you know, what, what 
Joe is underscoring, I think, is that the process of formalization is always going to be an eminently political process that at times is going to, you know, it's going to favor a certain group who's in power. And in some contexts that, that has to do with, you know, the politicians and the elites who are in power and other contexts, you know, perhaps you see more expansive, you know, electorally motivated versions of who's formalized as in the case of, you know, Latin America and favoring the poor with property titles was in part because these were voters and these were populist politicians trying to capture the votes of people who would benefit. So the coalition that's favored can, can vary. Um, and the other side of the system though, is we shouldn't, I don't wanna be too nostalgic for a system of a lack of recognition because it's also true that those systems permit tremendous coercion and inequality and the sorts of sort of, um, you know, erratic attempts to dispossess and seize and uproot existing property. So, for example, you know, indigenous communities that didn't have formal communal titles were very vulnerable to a politician saying, you never lived here. I suddenly need this land to, you know, mine gold or to build a road and you have no claim to it. And so when you ask what is what is the, the possibility, you know, what is the more flexible arrangement? I think it really does require us to think beyond the bounds of sort of no formalization of property and then state administrative systems of property. How could you recognize in a way property in a way that is socially embedded, that uses the fact that we all know indigenous tribe X has been on this land for generations and therefore has a claim to it, whether the state and the politician in power recognizes it, or whether you know the, the, the chief in charge suddenly says that you know the people shouldn't be living there. So so I think the question of you know more flexibility to me is more rethinking. And I think you know, especially in this age of all these digital tools that we have, trying to think, is there a way to identify ownership that is more horizontal? Is that prevents abuses of power by the state and also abuses of power by other members of society. And so that's to me where I think more flexible ownership and flexible forms of recognition could, could be imagined. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the, the way, at least that I think about some of this stuff is that you, a lot of these dis, dispossessions um, are most parsimoniously understood as just raw political coercion of one form or another. So that, you know, I don't think that the dispossession of Native Americans can really be chalked up to the, you know, an, uh, an insufficiently formalized system of property, right? Um, you know, and and you you might be able, it, it, it's a little, if you think about, for example, the enclosures, um, you, uh, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to do some really terrible amateur history here, but the uh, my understanding of that is that, uh, is that most of those lands were like in like in some nominal sense kind of owned by the barons already, but then for generations and generations there'd been like a de facto right to use them. Is that wrong? Uh, formalization is the creation of ownership. So that is not technically correct. Okay. Um, well, anyway, I mean, I, I think that the, um, uh, what I'm getting at is is that I, I think that the, the kinds of less rigid sorts of property interests that that are that interest me depend on the absence of this kind of raw coercion, right? Uh, they they depend on on the assumption that we have an overarching um, uh, framework of law and order that will, you know, essentially was going to respect whatever rights we end up defining, you know, those rights can be more rigid or more open textured. Um, but without this, uh, you know, when that assumption of, of, uh, uh, when that assumption, if we do away with that assumption that raw coercion is not going to happen here, then, you know, all bets are off basically. Um, so, uh, 
and I, I think this this transitions a little bit into the uh, um, the idea of a land value tax, uh, which uh, uh, you know has been uh, you know most famously discussed by Henry George. Um, that what interests me about the land value tax is that um, that in a sense it um, it it sort of tries to uh, to decouple the right to possess land with the right to sort of accrue political influence from it. Um, it in the sense that you know if you uh, if you happen to own a, a particular piece of land that becomes more valuable because of the network effects going on around it, um, you know, those, that additional value is going to be redistributed and so is going to be sort of less likely to empower the holder of that land to, uh, to corrupt the political process, for example, or to, or to extract, you know, rents, which might be two ways of saying the same thing. Um, and, uh, I'm curious. I'm curious what what you both think of of, of land taxes and and um, uh, whether you think that um, uh, you know there's something that we should you know still be kind of experimenting with or, or arguing for in the you know contemporary context. So, so land value taxation is a is, is a really interesting artifact of these long term debates over land ownership that we were referencing before. Um, Henry Henry George is uh, remembered by some American historians as a failed candidate for mayor of New York City in the in the eighteen eighties. But before that, uh, before that, he was a journalist in San Francisco who saw the the rise of the intercontinental railroads and the fortunes that they brought with them. And you'll remember from American history, I hope that the building of the uh, intercontinental railroads was a deeply corrupt affair in which uh, huge tracts of land, uh, which had been owned, occupied by native peoples, was turned over to the railways as payment for helping the process of settling and owning the American West. Uh, which was not only objected to by the Native Americans, but also to many of the, the white settlers who believed that they were entitled to settle and build upon that land. So we're talking about not just the right of way that the railroads are on, but all of the, the land on either side as a kind of compensation to the rail railway barons um, for building the railway. Uh, so George, George was an astute observer, and so he noticed that all of the, there was this conversation about the land getting paid off to the railway barons and then the telegraph barons. And then he noticed what was happening to his own town, San Francisco. So he noticed that those same people who owned the railways and the telegraph were what we would call gentrifying San Francisco. They were buying up the biggest tracts of land and becoming renters who profited from high rents um, for working class people. And in his imagination, the way that he told the story, all of California soon became the domain, the colonized domain of a handful of rich fortunes. And what had been a land of opportunity where a person could, a middle class person, a working class person could have a house, have a garden, set themselves up, was soon this bustling metropolis in which all of the revenue flowed towards the land barons. So George developed a critique a critique of land monopolization. And that his, his view of human history, land monopolization is the, the single force of oppression that needs to be fought back to have uh, an economy that's embraced, that's characterized by opportunity for all. He went on speaking tours of, um, of, of Ireland, Scotland, and England uh, in the 1880s at a time when colonial conflict between England and Ireland was boiling over, completely boiling over, also boiling over in Scotland. And you have, you have actual wars between the sheriffs and the tenants. Uh, the tenants are, are refusing to pay rent to the landlords in Ireland, and they are citing the whole history of confiscation. So not enclosure, but colonizing confiscation, the laws that said that Catholics couldn't own property. So they're, so they're refusing rent. Um, their houses are being burned down by the police or by private militias. Uh, the same thing is happening in Scotland. There are actual 
you know, counterattacks on the islands. So George goes to these places and gives a speaking tour in which he frames land ownership as a global problem that's been created by largely British colonization. The same issue in India, the same issue in Ireland, the same issue in California. And he makes the argument that it can only be fought back by a system of property that, realize, that recognizes that the value of land is a social creation. The hill in San Francisco is valuable because, not because the land baron was a sh is smart or better working or made something useful. It's Russian Hill is valuable because of all of the other people who live near Russian Hill who have built restaurants and take the trolley car. Uh, and through owning all of the land, the land baron who owns Russian Hill captures all of that value for him and never redistributes it. And George sets forth an, a vision of what a state could do to correct that set of affairs by taxing land, by taxing the individuals who own the most land the highest and redistributing the benefit. So what he means by redistributing the benefit is that the land tax should be used to bring up the worst slum or the newest suburb of San Francisco to the status of Russian Hill or, um, or Market Square, where it, it those places too should be connected by trains, connected by trolley cars. They should have public lights and sidewalks and paving, maybe public schools and parks. So redistributing the benefit, capturing the social wealth of the city to bring on more neighborhoods and more people into the economy at large. Oh, I was muted there. Sorry. That's a that's a thanks for that um, that summary. That's uh, that's perfect. And I mean, one of the um, one of the things that uh, strikes me about Henry George's thinking and about the idea of the land tax is it sheds a very clear light. On, um, on a problem that doesn't receive that much tension, I think, which is that, uh, that in some cases, if you don't own land, public goods can be against your interests. So in, in other words, it, you know, if, you are, if you are a renter and there's no rent control and you can't afford to pay more, then your city getting better is not good, right? And that's an incredibly perverse um, incentive that uh, that strikes me as as you know very close to the heart of of what um, of the you know the the angst and the and the suffering that you know is going on you know today in in American and in and, and other kind of global cities and um, and uh, uh, yeah do you do you agree with that take and do you think um, do you think land value taxes work? I just add on to that, but it's not even just the cleavage between landowners and renters, but it's also potentially cleavages between landowners located in different geographic areas. So one of the fundamental problems when you think about why public goods are underprovided or, or public works like, you know, subways or, you know, parks is that, you know, one one area might not want to fund those amenities in, in, in a different geographic area. And so, you know, you can think of, you know, the New York City subway system. Why should Oklahoma pay to fund New York City subway repairs? Or why should upstate New York pay? Or why should Harlem pay for a subway that's going through the Bronx? So those spatial cleavages create real problems when you think about actually providing the types of public goods that, that are central to making societies and cities work. And so one of the things that land value taxes are doing is, you know, is, is addressing the cleavage between landowners and renters. But the other thing that land taxes can do is also try and build 
spatial compromises by saying that if your land value arise, rises due to, you know, the provision of a subway line in your area, well, you should be paying a lot more for that subway line. And somebody who's living 10 kilometers or, you know, 100 kilometers away from the subway should be paying nothing or much, much less. And so I think that recognizing that um, you know, land taxes can be central to creating the types of geographic compromises is, is, is another point that's often is often missed and I think is really important as we think about, especially in you know, a federal country like the United States and also in a, in a really spatially segregated set of cities that we have in, in the US, how you can actually build kind of more um, political compromises around the provision of public goods. So there's um, uh, the, 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 I find land taxes interesting because they have this long history of being sort of uh, beloved by uh, economists and, you know, celebrated as this brilliant, perfect idea. Um, and yet the, the actual examples of them being successful are like not, not zero, but a little thinner on the ground than you might expect. So um, there are uh, uh, two, two of the most uh, successful examples are um, in, in Taiwan and in Estonia. They have different versions of, of land value taxes that are um, um, reasonably moderate, you know, that essentially split the, uh, the increases in land value between the landowners and the public, but, you know, nonetheless tax land value increases in a, in a substantial way that funds, um, uh, funds public goods, like in, in Estonia's cases, it fund, it provides uh, um, uh, much of the budget for local government. Um, and then even in, um, even in the uh, capitalist paradise of the United States, uh, there are um, uh, you know a few interesting examples of this. Like there are uh, several towns, several cities in Pennsylvania um, that have successfully implemented uh, uh, sort of a, a split dual rate uh, property taxes that tax the uh, increases in land value at a higher rate than they tax the uh, um, uh, the improvement value. Um, and, uh, um, you know, this is something that uh, obviously, you know, as, as I mentioned, like every, every few years, uh, you know, uh, lots of, of prominent economists sort of come out and say, you know, we should be doing this more, but it just hasn't happened. I, th I think it's interesting to look at, at why it hasn't happened. So, one example is in the town of Altoona, Pennsylvania. Altoona um, implemented one of the most radical land taxes in the United States between the years of 2011 and uh, 2016. And essentially in, in 2016, uh, a bunch of uh, property owners just got sort of confused and upset about it and the, and the, and the town backed off of it, even though there didn't seem to be much evidence that it, that it wasn't working. It seemed to be working fine. Um, similarly, in, in Pittsburgh, um, the, uh, w the idea was they sort of pulled back from a land tax in the year 2001, uh, in large part because they had failed to reassess land values for many, many decades prior to that. And then when they did a reassessment in 2001, the land value uh, taxes increased dramatically on a lot of landowners, and there was a uh, great outcry um, and they, uh, they they backed off it and I, I think that they they've gone back to it um, uh, successfully in just in the context of I think like downtown Pittsburgh um, but um, uh, I'm curious whether you have thoughts about land value taxes uh, why haven't they been as popular as they might be and uh, how do they compare to other sorts of systems of, uh, of redistributing the you know, increment from land value, such as uh, rent control or, um, or self-assessment mechanisms um, or, or, or otherwise? 
So those are super interesting examples, uh, Matt. What, the example that I'm more, more familiar with of a famous disaster around land use taxation is Prop 13. So Prop 13 in California uh, is, is, was a land, was a proposition to cap the land tax. It's not what Henry George had in mind exactly. Uh, it, it, um, in, because in fact, it freezes land taxes rather than making sure that Russian Hill pays more and more of the tax burden of the entire city of uh, San Francisco as the people in Russian Hill uh, are worth more and more. So it, it stopped a progressive land tax in the bud, but it was a land tax. So very often when you talk to people who are familiar to, with urban planning or land economics about land taxes, they say, well, what about Prop 13? So Prop 13 was uh, famously passed as a political maneuver putting, uh, promising the elderly uh, that they would never see another land tax again. So it was a trade-off of winning the elderly vote by shutting down California, the state of California's access to land tax revenue. And so uh, under Prop 13, the schools in California went from the best in the nation to much further down the scale. And it has proved almost impossible to dislodge Prop 13 because there are so many individuals who feel that they are protected only by Prop 13, that their, that their uh, home ownership is, um, their home ownership is their one asset and they can't endanger it in a California, which is increasingly, uh, which is an incre increasingly difficult for anybody who's not a dot-com billionaire. Um, so I think one of the issues that Prop 13 illustrates is that we've been, we've been circling around conversations about land taxation for a long time. Uh, but there's been, you know, even though it goes in and out of fads and economics departments, the promise of land value taxation is not deeply understood by most ordinary citizens. And that, it sounds like that may be what happened in both Altoona and, and, and Pittsburgh. Um, you know, people... Well, uh, sorry, just a quick interjection. Am I, am I correct, though, in thinking that Prop 13 ha was, had to do with property tax as opposed to uh, simply land tax? I, I could, I, as a Californian, I should know, but I, isn't that right? Alicia, do you know? I always thought of it as about property tax, but I also am not... <laughs> I'm, I'm not well-versed. I will say that uh, in George's conception of how these taxes would work, uh, the land tax becomes the single tax. So his idea is that it will replace the income tax and any other tax. The only tax you will pay will be this reflection of where you live in the city. So move to the edge of the city, you, you resolve your tax problems. It's only if you want to pay big bucks to be in the middle of Times Square that you end up paying high rates of taxation. Um, it's supposed to redisperse the benefit, as we as we said. Um, uh, it uh, so so you know off, often those aspects of uh, land taxation don't come up when the matter is under conversation is in dispute today. It relies upon having being assessed, having the property property assessment conducted and. Uh, an open, regular manner so that you don't have this issue with Pittsburgh in 2001 where the assessment is decades out of date and then suddenly there's a hike. Uh, it's supposed to be gradual in scope. Um, and ideally, you know, if you end up leaving your house because the property taxes have gotten too high, that's also because the land value has gone high up. And then there's one other part of the land value system as conceived of by George, which is often forgot, which is the state is landlord. Uh, state is sole landlord. So in George's idea about how this will work, uh, there will be no more landlords and tenants who are renting under the land tax. There will just be this one system of land taxation. And then the land, the state will take care of all of those functions of updating the building, just as the state would take care of updating uh, subway systems and sidewalks and public schools. The state will also make sure that your basement isn't leaking, all of these functions that in, in some way the state does by its codes, but that would actually be the function of the state. And so you can, everyone would be renting from the state. So that's the system that's actually been tried out in Singapore. Uh, Sing, you know, Singapore doesn't have 
the best r record on human human rights and civil society. But in terms of its housing, you talk to people about their their housing in in Singapore, and uh, the verdict tends to be, you know, no complaints. All of the housing works. All of the sidewalks are immaculate. Everybody has. Everybody, including the poorest members of the working class, have good ventilation and good light and uh, good resources because the state is the landlord and it, it maintains, uh, the land tax maintains a very high quality of life overall in terms of what kinds of housing ordinary people have access to. Yeah, so th that's a great transition to questions because one of the top questions is uh, uh, from Mark Fraser of the Startup Societies Foundation. Uh, Mark says, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Macau are free market economies with socially owned land. Income from land leasing helps fund basic services. Can this model spread? What do you- I what do you say it spread. I mean, I think it is at the heart of, you know, how they've achieved high levels of public goods provision and at the same point, you know, maintaining a free market economy. So I do think it is a, a tremendous model for funding public works. I think it's also a difficult model to transition to because the idea of the state as as landlord and sort of, you know, um, actually developing these properties and using the rents associated to invest in public goods, I think has very much fallen out of favor. Um, so I think it's hard politically, but I think it is a, an interesting path. And so, um... Jumping from uh, contemporary Singapore to medieval Europe, um, how were peasant farmers able to control the negative externalities, I guess, in, in, in the commons? Um, was it simply the benefit of having a tight social context? I think this is a super interesting question. Um, you know, to, to what extent, um, to what extent uh, more sort of, uh, as I call them, like open textured um, property interests uh, can work in um, societies that don't have uh, these sorts of informal ties. Yeah, so a really interesting way to answer that is to look at Eleanor Ostrom's Governing the Commons. So Ostrom was the first Nobel Prize, female Nobel Prize winner in economics. Um, there'd be many more. Um, Ostrom and her husband spent 20, 30 years before the publication of their book on governing the commons, collecting uh, information about common pool systems, um, both from medieval historians looking at how the medieval system of the commons worked and looking at common pool fisheries and forests all over the world where native people um, fish together, graze their cows together, grow trees together and so on. And uh, they, they, developed an enormous database and they coded how each of these systems worked so that they could test, you know, is it, does this only work if you're like, if you've married all of your cousins for five generations, like, what do you have to do? And the answer is no, you don't have to marry all of your cousins for five generations. What you have to do is you have to have a visible public accounting system, which could mean that you bring the fish out and show them off in the market square. There have to be limits, some form of li limits, like, Alicia can put a cow at the park at the end of the street, but she can't put 50 cows in the park at the end of the street. And similarly, um, if Alicia's third cousin arrives and wants to use the park, he can't, he's an outsider. So there are some limits, there's some visible ways of checking who's participating, there are punishments if there are infractions of that system. So a commons doesn't mean communism and it doesn't mean total anarchy. It means that there are systems of describing and regulating natural resources to the benefit with the benefit to all over the benefit to one at a time predominating. Thanks. Um, with more, uh, uh, here's another question. So, uh, what what if with so many more potential uh, assets to own, uh, land ownership becomes less important as people diversify their holdings? And I would uh, I. I'll put a gloss on this question, which is, I also think it's interesting to think about the uh, whether location and land and space could possibly become less important um, as we all uh, live our lives on Zoom and uh, and things like that. Um, what do you, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's an interesting conjecture. I mean, that, uh, in, if all, all of Silicon Valley starts investing in Bitcoin, uh, and hold, holding stocks of startups instead of investing in land. But I don't think that's what we see as happening. 
because for one thing, um, the, the tremors of the stock market and then the instability of new currencies and other currencies and assets means that land has traditionally been a recourse for people who want to stabilize their asset base. And so it's a good investment. Um, and I think if you want to play out science fiction scenarios, one that's also worth entertaining is suppose that all of Silicon Valley has invested in Bitcoin and Bitcoin continues its, its precipitous ascent and is then worth a thousand million times more than the dollar. The dollar is relatively worthless. What happens to all the landowners and middle class neighborhoods? What if they all become renters uh, beholden to REITs, real estate investment trusts? Um, which exist to serve financial capital, well, then, then you risk having a situation much like Europe in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, where nobody owns their home. And then already some, Trump repealed many of the protections on the middle class, uh, middle class home ownership, many of the incentives for middle class home ownership. So you could really imagine in a generation moving from a world where middle class people own their homes in the United States to a world of renters who can be evicted at the drop of a hat if there aren't social protections against rent hikes in their city. For example, in the city in which I live in Dallas, Texas, there's nothing to prevent a new landlord coming in. In fact, this happened to us. This happened to us last year. We had to move in a hurry because our apartment building was acquired by a new landlord who had decided to raise the rent $500 every year. We're at time, but thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe and Alicia. This was a ton of fun um, and a great conversation. Um, really glad we got to do it. Um, and thanks everyone for listening as well. Thank you, this was wonderful. And thanks for the great questions. Likewise, thank that you. It was so fun to hear your perspective. Thanks, all right. <laughs>